forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. That's putting it mildly, 007. You owe us big time from Moonraker. Hi, I'm Kevin from the SDP, and this is the 007 Diamond Jubilee. Our story starts off the coast of Albania, where a British spy ship is sunk and along with it, a submarine control device called the ATAC. In order to keep the Soviets from getting their hands on it, the British government hires Sir Timothy Havelock, an archaeologist working in Greece, to recover it. But he is killed in view of his daughter Melina. James Bond is thus dispatched to Spain, Italy, and Greece to find the ATAC and uncover those who would steal it for themselves or the Russians. That is, unless Melina manages to exact her deadly revenge upon them. Bond girl Melina Havelock, having seen her father and mother gunned down, wants to kill those responsible, despite Bond's intentions to take them alive. It's refreshing to have a Bond girl not just in it for the fan service, but taking matters of the plot into her own hands. On the other hand, the teenage figure skater BB Doll adds virtually nothing to the plot, but does showcase the villain's villainy in her later confrontations with him. She also puts the moves on Bond, despite an age gap of 30 years between the actors, but thankfully, he rebuffs her affections. You get your clothes on, and I'll buy you an ice cream. I'm not identifying the villain, per se, because the film does something unusual on the matter. We have two rival Greek industrialists and smugglers, but only one of these guys wants to sell the ATAC device to the KGB, so the morality pecking order is still clearly defined. First, we meet Aris Christatos, who in addition to his illicit enterprises, also sponsors Baby Doll. And in the other corner is his rival, Milos Colombo, who overacts some of his scenes, but like Karen Bay of From Rush With Love, it only makes him that much more fun to watch. The villain of this movie employs a number of henchmen, including Emil Leopold Locke, an assassin and Bill Gates lookalike. I wish he had actual lines in the script, and that his killings weren't done off-screen, but still, he's proof that you don't have to come out of one of Hitler's wet dreams in order to be deadly. On the other hand, Eric Kriegler fits that description, being an East German biathlon champion and the villain's liaison with the KGB. With him being a pro sharpshooter, and to think that's only his cover, you'd think he'd be able to hit Bond for once. To be fair, during the ski chase early on, he does manage to shoot Bond's gun and ski pole to quite smaller targets. There's not much to speak of in terms of gadgets, since this film was an attempt to dial down the spectacle compared to the last few entries. In a rather brilliant bucking of his traditional image, Bond's sports car self-destructs early in the film, forcing him to hitch a ride in Molina's Junker's Citroen, and he still makes a gripping chase scene out of it. Love a drive in the country, don't you? <laughs> For Your Eyes Only is also notable for its pre credit sequence for two reasons. One, Bond stops at the grave of his dead wife, acknowledging the events of a certain film I will not mention for fear of spoilers. This scene was put in to acclimatize a potential replacement for Roger Moore, in case he chose not to stay on the role, which of course he did. Then, not Ernst Stavro Blofeld tries to get his revenge by hijacking his helicopter. Because of the Spectre rights controversy I mentioned in my Thunderball review, his face is not shown and his name is not given. But he is dropped from a helicopter into the middle of a tall smokestack, presumably killing him and for all intents and purposes, putting the kibosh on the Eon Cannon's conflict with Kevin McClory once and for all. The theme song is performed by Sheena Easton. Bill Conti of Rocky fame co-wrote the song and composed the soundtrack, to which he gave a distinct post-disco feel if you're into that sort of thing. Blondie also wrote their own title song which was passed over. If you're expecting something other than an 80s rehash of Secret Agent Man, I can't imagine you'll have much use for that one, but the band was nice enough to put it on their album The Hunter if you want to check it out. The opening credits use a watery, dreamlike theme which gels with the film's emphasis on underwater scenes and softer pastel colors to match the tone of the song. Together they become even more beautiful. Although I'm not sure about the decision to show Easton singing along on camera, the first and only time this has been done in the Bond franchise. Maybe I have a thing against looking at the fourth wall, 
which is very hypocritical considering the format of my main show. After subsequent movies escalating from global destruction from the sea to global destruction from space, it's refreshing that the writers avoided trying to top that, and instead focused on a more personal, political thriller. Ironically, most of the tension in this film comes from the stunts, including the underwater search for the ATAC, the rock climb up to a monastery, and others. If this seems unfitting of Roger Moore's 007 persona, not only does it showcase how off-track said persona had become, but it's because this film was written for another lead actor in mind, although a handover never happened. But with Moore turning 54 years old in 1981, one wishes he did take a retirement, especially with the next few films we have to sit through. Still, For Your Eyes Only scores 95% an A. Alright, keep your hair on. Give us a kiss. Give us a kiss. Oh, well, really, Mr. Bond. Oh.